Cool. Okay. So um, <clears throat> I am Jeff Klein. I'm one of the leaders of a group that focuses on validation in 4C. Uh, Sean Murphy and I kind of run that group and I'm going to talk about some early activities surrounding the uh, the severity measure that Griffin mentioned and how important that is to to our network. Um, only my name is on this slide because if I start adding more names, then I add hundreds of names. But I, I assure you, I'm not the only one who's been involved in this. And I have acknowledgement slides coming up. Um, let's see, how do I go to the next slide? So this was a paper that we published on this in February of this year. Uh, it's called Validation of an Internationally Derived Patient Severity Phenotype to Support COVID-19 Analytics from Electronic Health Record Data. Um, and honestly, one of the most interesting things about this paper was how many authors there were. I think we had 37 uh, named authors and then another author, it was the consortia, uh, the 4CE consortia, which is another hundred or so um, authors that are tucked away under this label. And that we found publishing papers in 4C that this has really challenged the academic publishing platforms because they, are, they, they do not allow you to enter more than 12 authors on most of their systems. Um, but it's, it's been a huge uh, collaboration. It's been awesome to work with so many great people. Um, as Griffin was, was mentioning, we needed a way to delineate what disease, uh, what COVID disease was severe and what COVID disease was less severe. Because patients who got hospitalized for COVID, um, even hospitalized, didn't necessarily have uh, terrible outcomes. So we, we wanted to find a way to, uh, to tag the patients who had more mild disease. Um, but we didn't really have outcomes data. Uh, as Griffin was saying, this is a volunteer effort. We're pulling data from a variety of uh, I2B2 and other data warehousing platforms around the country. So uh, I2B2 tends to not get everything from the hospital data. And um, then what we were pulling was a subset of that. So we didn't, we didn't have things like ICU admission um, or even death data in some cases. So uh, it's some, some of the clinicians in the group, uh, Gabe Bratt and Griffin Weber, put together this, this phenotype of 100 standard codes that um, logically made sense as good proxies of severity in the disease. But we didn't really know how good it was. So this study was about uh, digging into that and doing validation. We were able to track down uh, 12 sites out of our uh, you know, 100 or so sites that did have uh, reliable ICU data and death data. And we used that to compare to, um, to our severity proxies. So how did we land on these severity proxies? Well, we started looking at, well, how do you delineate severe disease in COVID-19? Uh, WHO had a definition where if you have a fever, suspect respiratory infection and a high respiratory rate or severe respiratory dis distress or low uh, arterial oxygen saturation, then you have severe disease. We didn't have any of that data. Uh, if you got a real diagnosis of a respiratory infection, that would show up. But we, we didn't have symptoms like fever. We didn't have um, nurse measured data like respiratory rate. We didn't have sensor data like oxygen saturation. We had the existence of oxygen saturation being monitored, but not the actual numbers. So we, we couldn't use the WHO definition. A simpler definition that others in you know, other studies we found used when that wasn't available was uh, ICU admission. And as I just said, we didn't have that either. So we came up with these uh, proxies and the proxies uh, were intended to uh, look for people who are being ventilated, having respiratory failure, and going into shock. Um, and, and the list is here at, at the bottom. Uh, I'm not going to take the time to read all that, but, but keep in mind that this is trying to find ways of detecting in the data we have ventilation, respiratory failure, and shock. Uh, so yeah, we couldn't use those. We ended up developing this one. And then <clears throat> Where I joined this, this group was when we decided we needed to validate this thing. Uh, so we wanted to compare the severity with that uh, other proxy of uh, severity, ICU admission and death, um, for sites that had that. And we wanted to look at what variation makes that patient severe. Another thing we thought about doing is, well, what if we just ignored all of this clinical expertise and just used the data? What would happen then? We can use machine learning and data mining and we can come up with a severity algorithm that doesn't even require um, people to go to med school. 
and how will that work? So we did a little bit of um, did a little bit of that at the end. And uh, there's interesting results on that. Uh, we had 12 sites participate. A lot, as you can see the hospital column, a lot more than 12 hospitals participated. Uh, many, many patients. So the, the 4C cohort is the number of patients. Those are all patients who were uh, COVID positive and admitted to the hospital. Um, these are our main results. So it's the specificity versus sensitivity of the severity proxy versus ICU or death. So high sensitivity is um, when a person is in the ICU or dies, then the severity proxy uh, says that that was true. So you want, I mean, you obviously want both high sensitivity and high specificity, but you can never get both. Um, and overall you see a cluster. These sites are anonymized. So there's, uh, there's, the GLO is uh, global, so those are non-U.S. sites. Just be a little U.S. centric here, unfortunately. And uh, the U.S. sites are uh, in, in the U.S., but but randomly arranged, um, so we don't we protect privacy and anonymity. And you can see in the meta-analysis, the sensitivity was pretty good. The specificity was great, um, but there's a huge amount of variance, right? We have like a site like this with uh, really great specificity, but terrible sensitivity. Um, and the opposite over here. Um, and in fact, kind of the, the takeaway from this whole study is variance. Things are very different <laughs> at different sites. So if you look at uh, sensitivity for individual outcomes, this is the particular measures, right? At, and each bar is a different site. Uh, so you have um, like PACO2, you would expect a PACO2 to be a pretty decent measure of ICU stay because you get your arterial oxygen saturation checked in the ICU and probably not outside of the ICU, or so we thought. Uh, but if you look at it, um, the, the sensitivity of this is way below 50% at a number of sites. Um, and in some, some of this is real variance in how medicine is practiced. Uh, a lot of it is differences in coding, how things are recorded. Um, we were dealing with a lot of international sites, so there was a challenge of translating concepts because the U.S. uses different coding systems for the most part than than uh, Europe, European countries, and all, all the European countries seem to use slightly different coding systems as well. Uh, so, so it really just highlighted the challenge of 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 figuring out what is in this mess of data. Although it also gave us uh, confidence that if you have enough enough codes, enough proxies, you get pretty good results. Um, because it something will work at your site, and then I just want to say something on the data-driven pilot. Like, do you need do you need clinical expertise at all? We used um, a generalized linear model and this newer algorithm MSMR to choose features from all the diagnosis, medication, and lab codes, and then try to uh, figure out what were what was the best set of proxies uh, for severity. And if you just look at the data the uh, AUC of the 4C definition, the one that was defined by experts, had an AUC of 0.9, and the machine learned model had an AUC of 0.95. So by that measure, you, you might think, well, we should use the machine learned model. But if you look at the top 10 codes that were learned by the machine learned model, there, there are some that make, make uh, sense and agree with what we came up with, uh, PACO2, PAO2, ARDS, sedatives, um, but then as you go down, you get into some weirder things like uh, D-dimer, as I understand, is just typically ordered um, in some ICU situations. And it doesn't necessarily mean the patient is severe. It's just where the patient is and what the, you know, what the pro hospital protocol is there. Um, and then there, there were some surprising ones like uh, chlorhexidine, uh, which is a, uh, a sanitizing wipe or, or a mouthwash. Um, and it not, and then that's just an MGH hospital protocol. Uh, everything is wiped down with chlorhexidine um, before you, uh, you know, before you inject someone with something. Um, and and that has nothing to do with severity. That just means if you're getting a lot of chlorhexidine on your body, then you're probably getting a lot of procedures, and it might, might mean nothing at all. Uh, so, all to say. I think we do need the clinical expertise. I, I hope that we can make more use of these machine learning models in the future to kind of aid us in coming up with more clever 
interesting um, approaches, but I think the clinical expertise is, is very, very important. Um, so yeah, the takeaways, that was what I just said. There are dramatic coding differences between the sites, um, but, so you need broad inclusive sets of codes that are resilient to that. Uh, you need uh, um, you need to use real ICU data. I didn't go into this, but if you look at just CPT codes and say, okay, that's my ICU data, it, the performance was terrible. Um, that it does not reflect, uh, it does not seem to reflect ICU state at all. There, there are ways around it. it some, some, I think uh, Kavi has shown that if you have multiple CPT codes uh, in, in uh, consecutive days, then you get closer to reality. But just looking at a CPT code for ICU stay is not a, not a great approach. Um, and then the data-driven approach creates non-generalizable patterns that um, need to be accounted for with some expertise. Um, I think I have a few minutes. If no one stops me, I'll keep talking. We are, we're working on some new stuff now. Um, so as, as hospital systems are opening up, and they're very open now. The uh, MGH has been at capacity for the last couple of weeks. Uh, people are being admitted for routine surgeries, things that they put off during COVID. And our severity algorithm looks for patients with a severe code. So someone who has anesthesia or is intubated is going to be labeled as severe. Um, but if you go in for a surgery, you're, you're obviously going to have anesthesia. And so and it doesn't mean you're severe, it just means you're in surgery. So uh, we, ne we needed to um, start thinking about what does the severity algorithm mean? Um, and so we wanted to look at, uh, find a way to delineate which COVID positive patients, so we're still going to look at just COVID positive patients, but which ones are admitted to the hospital because of their COVID and which ones are admitted to the hospital because of a routine reason. And it's surprising if you look at the data, um, there are people who end up being COVID positive. They find out they're COVID positive after they're in the hospital for some completely different surgical reason. And, and so we're, we're looking at ways of detecting that. We're using um, a technique uh, that Griffin pioneered called hospital system dynamics um, to look for just kind of metadata about how these hospitalizations go. So we don't have to you know, dig into the charts, but just kind of look at ordering patterns. Um, so this was a very early pilot that we did a few months ago. Um, we chart reviewed uh, uh, 59 patients admitted between March and July. Uh, so this is like early first wave COVID. Um, so in, in this particular time period, most patients were actually admitted, who went to the hospital were admitted because of COVID. But there were in, in this uh, cohort, there were uh, from a chart review perspective, it appeared that there were 11 hospitalizations that were for routine reasons. Um, well, 48 were COVID related. So we thought we'd look at the, just the number of labs ordered because that kind of reflects the amount of worry that patients have. Uh, I'm sorry, that physicians have about their patients. Um, and, and then uh, I also looked at a few particular labs that um, the 4C, some group in 4C was looking at as maybe more correlated with, uh, with, COVID, uh, with, with COVID disease. So we did find that um, if you were in the hospital for a COVID related hospitalization, you did tend to get more labs in the first two days. Uh, not dramatically more, but uh, there could be some signal there. A, a little bit more dramatically, though, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what this means because it's such a small sample in such an early part of the of the uh, of the pandemic. But if you had a lab order for lactate dehydrogenase, PaO2, PaCO2, or procalcitonin, then um, you were very likely to have been in the hospital for a COVID-related hospitalization. 94% of patients with uh, COVID-related hospitalizations had that versus 36% for routine. So don't go um, you know, to, to JAMA and say we have a, a, huge, a huge breakthrough here because this is again a small sample size at one site, but I think it points an interesting direction that we may, uh, we may be able to discern something um, about severity without looking at specific markers, but just looking at ordering patterns. Um, just, I, I think I'm out of time, but I just wanted to, to, I did a little bit of chart review and it is interesting uh, among five random patients, there, there were uh, two that definitely were in the hospital for COVID. Uh, someone was in the hospital for surgery to their left knee 
uh, COVID was not mentioned anywhere in their notes. Um, someone, uh, this one it, the, said their principal problem was COVID-19, but, um, but they they were in for substance use and COVID wasn't mentioned anywhere in their notes. Uh, and this person uh, unfortunately had an intracranial hemorrhage, um, but was in the hospital for that and just happened to be routinely tested for COVID because everyone is routinely tested for COVID. And uh, they they did not have COVID as any other part of their hospitalization. And this is a visualization that we're working on now to visualize uh, how different um, filters would remove sets of patients. And I'm not gonna take the time to go into this, but this is a, this is a fun fun visualization. And if you'd like to know more or, or even help us improve it, then, uh, then get in touch with me. And I was starting to make an acknowledgement slide. On the left top are all the people who worked on the paper. Uh, the, below that are a few people who have been deeply involved in the, this next phase of the project who are not on the top list. And on the right is kind of all of the people in the consortium, but it gets cut off. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's a massive, massive group and I'm, I'm privileged to be, to be able to be a part of it. 